your host, Dr. Wolfielan. When I'm not working on my second Big Bang where I'll get it right this time, I'm here at the Wolfie Lair reviewing movies. Welcome to phase six of my long-running series of internet videos that seven people in North Dakota have watched. That's a lot of people by North Dakota standards. If you're new to my show, well, I'm a movie reviewer. Glamorous, I know. And if you couldn't tell by my lovely accent, I'm also a Wolfielite. Not a werewolf. Calling me a werewolf is an insult. I am never a filthy human, and I can actually talk. You know what else? Silver bullets can't kill me. I'm totally invulnerable to silver. Regular lead bullets, though? Uh, yeah, they can actually kill me. It kinda sucks. Much to my chagrin, I get confused for a werewolf all the time. But after all these years, I have never degraded myself by reviewing a werewolf movie. Until now, because my adoring public wanted me to review an American werewolf in... Not London. Paris. Fucking jip. Well, I gotta admit, American Werewolf in London, released in 1981, is a great horror comedy by John Landis before he co-directed that movie that killed those people. But if it's any consolation, Blues Brothers is still a pretty cool movie. Seriously though, American Werewolf is a gem of a film. It's got a good sense of humor, it makes great use of its location, it reimagines the mythology of werewolves in an interesting way, and it's got amazing, groundbreaking special effects by Rick Baker. Good movie. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about a good movie in this video though. Fast forward 16 years to 1997 and the horror genre had changed a lot. Scream demonstrated that audiences were open to humor in their horror flicks. A second American werewolf film just seemed right, right? And why not bring in a new European locale too? Paris. And that's what we got, but An American Werewolf in Paris was made with no involvement by anybody from the first film, which is always great news if you like terrible sequels for some reason. Universal wasn't even involved in the second American Werewolf movie. Disney released this movie, cause when I think of horror, I think of that fucking animatronic Abraham Lincoln that Uncle Walt thought kids wanted to look at. They say it really is haunted by the tortured soul of the great emancipator himself. Disney spared no expense. So alright, the deck is stacked against an American werewolf in Paris, but maybe this is an underdog story. Maybe it could actually be a good movie. I mean, I already watched it and I know it isn't, but I love playing pretend. An American Werewolf in Paris is, at its heart, a love story. Yeah, a love story involving werewolves. Where have I heard that before? Of course, this movie has to be a love story though. Paris is the city of love after all. My herpes is a testament to that. I probably shouldn't have said that. Before we get to the romance, we've gotta get through the bromance. The main characters of the film are a disparate slash desperate trio of college-age boys trying to rack up the most lays across France. And I'm not talking about the chips, but honestly, a film about dudes collecting potato chips would be a delightful romp. These three homies are Andy McDermott, Brad, and Chris. A, B, C. Jesus Christ. Anyway, Brad and Chris are in the lead in this sex competition, not by virtue of actually getting much action, but just because Andy isn't participating. You, you haven't made a move this entire trip, Andy. I'm choosy. As the great Jerry Seinfeld would often say, What's the deal with that? Well, Jerry, Andy is looking for somebody special on this trip, not just some Saturday night fling. I mean, how many girlfriends did you even have on that show, Jerry? You should be ashamed of yourself, seriously. You can tell just from looking at them that Chris is the typical frat house surfer looking motherfucker. Brad is just some dweeby looking nerd, and Andy is the normal one that anybody can identify with that grows over time from being kind of whiny to being a hero, the Luke Skywalker of the group. In theory, that's how it's supposed to work. Unfortunately, Andy remains consistently whiny over the course of the film. There's sex and there's love. That's what differentiates humans from animals. Okay, fine, then when were you last in love? When were you ever in love? Maybe mixed in with some dickishness. I'll get into Andy's character a bit more later, though. Right now, I'm just sketching him out for you. The three bros are heading to Paris, so of course they go to the Eiffel Tower first. I mean, that's pretty much the only thing to do there. Paris is just Eiffel Tower storage if we're going to be brutally honest here. Apparently, the Eiffel Tower has no security at night because the boys have a run of the place. Andy intends to bungee jump off the side of the tower, which should logically kill him and make for a very short movie. 
Unfortunately, Andy's plans to unintentionally kill himself are nixed when a girl shows up who plans to intentionally kill herself. While Andy tries to save the girl, the opposite happens and they both fall to their deaths. Again, unfortunately, through the power of really awkward green screen effects, Andy rescues the girl by bungee cord without snapping off her leg. The girl is dropped gently to the ground, but Andy isn't so lucky when, you know, physics does what physics does. <laughs> now, I'd like to make something clear to all you kids at home. You can bungee jump off of the Eiffel Tower all you want. It's your life, and you can end it any way you choose to. But don't let this movie get the idea into your head that you're going to fucking wake up in a hospital bed, mildly concussed, covered with a few bandages, and surrounded by your friends after colliding with a girder at high speed. That's not gonna happen. You're just gonna be fucking dead. Your head will not even remotely resemble a head afterwards either. It'll probably look like a melting ice cream cone. Not exactly open casket material. So Andy wakes up and all he can think about is the girl from the previous night. That girl. Talk about the woman of my dreams. I think we're losing her. Yeah, he's in love with this girl, even though the only thing he knows about her is that she's fucking suicidal. If that's not true love, then true love is something that isn't insane. Okay, the next round of stuff is completely pointless to explaining what the basic story of this movie is, but I have to talk about it just so it's totally clear how little this movie gives a shit about telling a story with scenes that matter. You see, Andy wants to find the girl, but he's in no condition to do so. Instead, Andy sends his friends out in Paris to look for the girl themselves. The only lead that the boys have to go on is that the girl may have left a note behind that may indicate her location. So the boys have a cute little montage where they incompetently search for a piece of paper that was probably blown away by the wind or just thrown away in the fucking trash because it's trash. All in all, Brad and Chris are not successful, which is the realistic outcome, but this kind of realism is something you fucking leave out of a story. The movie is demonstrating that it does not respect your time by showing you shit that doesn't matter. I mean, I don't respect your time either. I'm the asshole who accidentally made a 40 minute long review of a Scooby-Doo movie, but at least I'm upfront about not respecting your time. Andy actually runs into the girl himself a little later because she's, coincidentally, a nurse at the hospital. Yeah, another love interest that's a nurse. Well, don't worry, it all makes sense in the end. Just bear with me here. While trying to get into contact with the girl, a doctor winds up concussing Andy further with a door, creating another rift between Andy and his dream girl. Guess what, though? Andy's friends somehow find the girl's note, and now they know where she lives. Kinda creepy. So, that last part wasn't so pointless, right? No, not really, because Andy at least now knows that the girl's a hospital employee and he could have just asked around. It would have been more likely than finding a piece of paper out in Paris. The suicidal French girl is named Seraphine, and she doesn't want anything to do with Andy and his crew, but Andy can't take no for an answer, probably because he's in a fraternity. Andy notices that something is off with Seraphine, besides the attempted suicide, when he gets a glimpse of her hand covered in blood. I'd make a joke about that, but then I'd have to put a quarter in the jar. To finally get Andy out of her hair, Seraphine agrees to a date with him. Please, look, I just want to talk. I don't think it's a good idea. Please, just once. If you let me, then I will never bother you again. Okay. Tomorrow, four o'clock, in front of the concert hall. You mean it? I promise. This has got to be the most awkward circumstance for asking somebody out. Stalking a suicidal girl, tracking her down to her home, finding her covered in blood, and going out on a date with her to keep her from killing herself. You know, that's not a cute story to tell to your future kids. Andy shows up to the date dressed like a kid at Disneyland. I mean, the guys might have come back from a day at Euro Disney for all I know. The date starts off appropriately super quiet and awkward, but it gets worse when Seraphine says the ultimate buzz kill. My parents are dead. <laughs> what is she, fucking Batman? Can you believe that this date could spiral further down into hell? Well, it totally can when Andy throws a significant number of condoms onto the table, and he then tries to play it cool by passing off the condoms as bubblegum. <laughs> they take chewing gum to make it look like condoms. Of course, he chews a condom and blows it into a bubble. Like this is a Farrelly Brothers movie. Now, keep in mind that this is a horror comedy like the first, but there is a lack of horror in the first 20 minutes. In the first 20 minutes of the first flick, we see a werewolf attack a character that we actually know. The second movie shows a guy attacked in the first couple of minutes, sure, but we don't know who he is until a lot later. 
The point is, when you're mixing genres, keep a healthy balance. Do not give us condom chewing when you haven't earned it with a good werewolf murder. Wow, what a ripoff. My friends told me it was chewing gum. <laughs> so yeah, you're probably wondering where the werewolves even are in this movie. Well, don't worry, I'm about to get to them. Andy, continuing to bother Seraphine, comes to her house unannounced, along with his friends, but they are instead greeted by a douchey-looking Leon the Professional. This guy is Claude, and he loves Americans. I love Americans. See? What did I tell you? Claude invites the boys to a charity party at a place called Club de la Lune, and it's gonna happen during the full moon. Hmm. Oh, shit. I just realized something. That's a really well-drawn logo. So the gang heads to Club de la Lune, which looks like an inner-city fallout shelter. Within the club, they find a puke-covered, sleeping homeless man, and an extra that's pissing on a barrel with candles on top of it. Haha! <laughs> Reminds me of Studio 54. Good times. Seraphine shows up at the werewolf trap, I mean, party, as well, to rescue Andy, but, you know, she leaves Brad for dead because fuck that guy. Seraphine has Andy go on without her because some, uh... Changes are happening. These dudes transforming at the party are making the faces of a teenage boy jerking it. <laughs> yes, Seraphine is a she-wolf, and yes, during her computer-aided transformation sequence, she does grow two extra pairs of nipples because that's a necessary detail. Well, she's still less hairy than the average French woman. <laughs> Amidst all the bloodshed, Andy gets bitten by a werewolf, but unfortunately, he escapes. It's a cruel world we live in. Seraphine greets Andy in the morning and tries to get him to drink a suspicious red liquid. Unlike me, Andy is unwilling to blindly drink any crimson, copper-scented smoothie given to him, so Seraphine goes topless. This will relax, you know? Oh boy. Seraphine's partial nudity is a way of breaking to Andy the fact that he's a werewolf now. It was... it was a werewolf. <laughs> a lot of shit happens during this uncomfortable extended groping sequence. Andy has a nightmare vision of Seraphine transforming into a werewolf, and then Andy and Seraphine's sexy time is interrupted by Seraphine's mother. First Claude, now this. Can't you be more careful? Which is enough of a buzzkill, but the mom also happens to be a zombie. Oh my god! Andy does the only rational thing to do in this situation. Whoa! Ah! Well, that's one way to get out of a one-night stand. The story of an American werewolf in Paris, of course, heavily mirrors the original film. Andy tries to get to the bottom of this werewolf nonsense, the police are suspicious of Andy, and Andy has to deal with being nagged to commit suicide by the ghosts of people that have become werewolf food. Yeah, the ghosts are back, and honestly, the ghosts are probably the only thing in this movie that would give you a clue that this was an American werewolf film, and not some random dime-a-dozen werewolf flick. The ghosts in the sequel are, well, overdone. In the original, they were subtle. Jack progressively decays, but he still behaves like a normal person would. In this sequel, though, the fucking ghosts act like Casper. Like this is a children's movie where they're going through walls and doing all kinds of wacky shit. I can't rest in pieces around here. It's ridiculous. Also, the gore effects in the sequel look really contrived, compared to Rick Baker's more natural look. Jack looked like he was attacked by a werewolf. Brad? Uh, well, not so much. Maybe a really small werewolf, like a were-corgi. While I'm still on the subject of effects, this movie kind of tosses out the major thing people remember from the original. A werewolf realized with sophisticated practical effects. The transformation in the original was a landmark effect that showed how far the effects industry had come since the days of Lon Chaney Jr. Werewolves are a particularly effects-heavy creature, and in a horror film, you kind of have to believe the scary thing is real or else you won't be scared. So, from the first film to the second film, we go from having sophisticated practical effects that have been developed over decades to computer-generated effects that had only been around at the time for maybe a little over a decade. The CGI does not look good. It's not laughably bad or incompetent. The CGI is just soulless, and it doesn't look like much of an effort was made to make you believe that it's there. Think back to Jurassic Park. The reveal of the Brachiosaurus still holds up, not because the CG has necessarily aged well, 
but because the movie does some shit to make you feel like that big-ass lizard is actually present. The dinosaur eats from a real tree, and it stomps down, causing the earth to shake. That's enough to accept that all the dinosaurs in that movie are really there, and you can enjoy the film without thinking about the CGI. <sighs> With this movie, the CG werewolves show up, and there's CG, and there's not much thrown in to make you think that they physically occupy space. They have shadows, at least. Thank God for that. Ugh. When the movie does need to have the werewolves interact with something, it cuts to a practical effect of a werewolf head, which means they could have probably done the whole movie that way, but they really wanted to jump on the CG bandwagon, but found out that their CG would look really fake, so they had to use something real for close-ups. Jurassic Park did the same thing, but they had ILM and Stan Winston Studios, so the two blended together pretty damn well. With this werewolf flick, it's pretty obvious where the CG begins and the practical ends, which, you know, takes you out of the story. Another issue with the werewolves are the designs. They aren't really scary, horrifying creatures. They have fucking abs, for God's sakes. They're like the superhero version of a werewolf, not the horror kind, and their faces don't look much like a wolf. They look more like lions or donkey from Shrek, and they move around like a dude in a quad suit. Real fucking scary, bro. Effects aren't everything, though. What about the story and characters? Well, the story of an American werewolf in Paris pretty much hits the same beats as the first flick. It's about a dude in Europe dealing with being a werewolf. American Werewolf in Paris does take a very different path towards the end, but that path is just pure silliness that makes you forget it's supposed to be a horror movie and not an action-adventure movie. The tone of the sequel is too lighthearted for its own good. The original film was a comedy, sure, but a very dark comedy where David was stuck in a hopeless situation where the only cure for his lycanthropy was suicide. Take your life, David. Kill yourself. Before you kill others. The sequel, though, says you don't have to kill yourself after all. Brad the Ghost reveals that a werewolf can be cured by eating the heart of the werewolf that bit them. Find the werewolf that bit you. Then kill it. Then he got its heart. How do the ghosts know this? Who is briefing them with this information? Another big criticism that I have of an American werewolf in Paris is that Paris isn't used all that effectively. The original film used England extensively and made the setting feel necessary to the story. The sequel, though, has French accents, some Parisian exteriors, but by and large, this movie takes place in dingy, abandoned buildings. If you had this fucking movie on mute, you'd have a little bit of trouble identifying the country it's supposed to take place in. You know, if it wasn't for the Eiffel Tower scene. Compare this to the original, where there's no mistaking the setting for anywhere but London. I mean, look at this shit. Nobody wears that hat anywhere else unless they're a fucking weeb. Okay, so story is garbage, but maybe hidden in the pile of trash are some great characters. Tom Everett Scott plays the main character in this film, and I don't know why. Uh, it's the guy who, um... I've got your shoe. The Andy character has no charisma. He's kind of dopey, and he tends to be a whiny little bitch. Go! Go after her! Come on! Andy, you need to get back in bed, man. Hurry up, you dope! She's getting away! This one guy's hallucinating. Andy, relax, relax. Sometimes you can blame this on the script, but I don't think the script is completely to blame for it. Another bottle of the Poo Willy Fwissy. Pardon? La Hooch du Jour. Andy is a wiener. Julie Delpy as Seraphine is... Well, uh, she's there. She's not annoying or stupid. She's just present and kind of boring. Saying that kind of thing about a character is a fucking death sentence. Wait, when do I get to see you again? I don't think we should. Andy, it's only because I care about you. You have a funny way of showing it! The only notable character I can claim that this movie has is Julie Bowen as Amy. For some reason, when Andy is still a human, he acts a lot like a dog would. I didn't know that becoming a werewolf made you an other kin. Anyway, he meets Amy because she's wearing cat perfume or some shit, and he really wants to fuck her because nothing is sexier than somebody who smells like cats. And that's, uh... Hot kitty you're wearing. Wow. So, you know, Andy fucks Amy in a graveyard. Like, on top of a person's grave. The writers of this movie have a strange idea of what's hot. In the middle of the graveyard sex, this happens. Hey! Oh, don't worry, Andy. This kind of thing happens to every guy. Well, Andy actually turns into a werewolf, slaughters Amy, and wakes up naked next to a dead dog and a crowd of people. Man, if I had a nickel for every time this happened to me, 
Well, I'd have $800.65. Here's the thing, though. Amy is dead, so she becomes a ghost. Thanks for a lovely evening, douchebag. There's something strangely delightful about an over-the-top bitchy ghost that tells off this loser for killing her. It's a simple pleasure, and it doesn't last very long. Oh. The rest of the characters are trash. Except maybe Inspector LeDuc, who's like a cross between Inspector Clouseau and Hannibal Lecter. He's okay, just for how bored he can look in any situation. You're under arrest. What for? The possibilities are limitless. Very, very French. The music of an American werewolf in Paris is... Music. Okay, I'm gonna spoil this movie for you. If for some reason you plan on watching this shit yourself, go to this time code to see my final verdict and may God have mercy on your soul. At a certain point, Andy is dragged into a car by some guys. Sounds like France to me. The abductors are Claude and his crew. You see, Claude's not just a douchey looking French dude wearing a goatee and a sleeveless shirt. Claude is also the leader of a werewolf society. Wow, werewolf society would be a great band name. It's revealed that Seraphine is the daughter of David from the first movie and that she was born a werewolf. Until he was killed in London, his daughter was born in Paris. Seraphine. It's not really explained that well how Claude fits into this, but he somehow entered Seraphine's life, got her blood, and became a werewolf himself. Claude basically sees werewolves as superior to humans, like every person who is still on DeviantArt. The villain only ever tells the hero their plan when they're going to kill them a little later, because people you're going to murder should at least get some closure. But no! Claude actually wants Andy to join up with his legion of French leather boy werewolves. Will you join us, Andy? This is like the point in a video game where you get to decide if you want the good ending or the bad ending. Andy is presented with a moral choice, of course. Andy has to murder his bro, Chris. You know, chaining a naked guy up in a dungeon raises some serious questions about these werewolves. Andy can't kill a bro, though, and trusts that the evil werewolves won't just kill Chris themselves. Back at Seraphine's place, she reveals that her stepdad had been working on a cure, but she happened to have mauled the guy earlier, and he ends up dying. Killed him. The bastards. We doom now. Well, let me have a shot at it. I got an A in chemistry. No, you didn't. Shut the fuck up. Andy and Seraphine find out that Claude has a 4th of July party planned where he and his boys will kill a bunch of Americans in an abandoned cathedral. Man, there sure are a lot of abandoned buildings in Paris. Even the Eiffel Tower was abandoned. Andy tries to save his American brethren, but Americans don't ever back down from a good party where the host dressed like the Grim Reaper. The French police arrest Andy, and instead of handcuffing him, they just walk him away with a gun pointed against his fucking head. Riding Andy out of a pair of handcuffs would have been too damn hard. The bad dudes inject themselves with a serum that will transform them into werewolves without a full moon, and it looks like they're shooting up with vanilla pudding. Was a full moon ever really needed in these werewolf movies anyway? Seems like every night has a goddamn full moon. The werewolves do werewolf things. I don't need to make this a total plot synopsis. Watch the fucking movie if you really want to know what happens. At a certain point, Brad enters the great beyond because the werewolf that killed him is dead. I miss you, Andy. Me too. I'm so sorry. That's really touching, but it doesn't really make sense with the canon. In the original, Jack wasn't killed by David, but Jack still had to haunt David because there's still a werewolf knocking around. You know, whatever. Fuck it. They probably didn't watch the first movie, whatever. Let's fast forward through these plot holes. Seraphine was injured, and it's looking bad, so she decides to say fuck it and just let Andy eat her heart so he'll be cured. We'll be free. It would be really ballsy and a good ending appropriate for a horror film if Andy actually did murder his girlfriend and eat her heart, but this is a superhero film, so Andy instead flees when the cops show up. Andy ends up in a subway and has an epic werewolf battle with Claude. Claude dies like a bitch, and Andy eats that dude's heart instead, thus curing him. Okay, you are not gonna fucking believe this next part. In an ambulance, Seraphine is visited by the ghost of her dead stepfather who, get this, has figured out the cure for being a werewolf beyond the grave. I found it. A permanent cure. Just follow these simple instructions, and we'll have a serum that works for life. What is this, some Star Wars shit? I, I just can't believe this. You can tell Disney was in charge when a horror movie has a happy ending. The original film's ending was dark and sad, which was great to me because I shouldn't feel uplifted when I come out of a horror flick. With the sequel, though, we see the only dead main character go to heaven, and everyone else lives, including Chris. Chris gets out. 
Sure, naked and stuck to a cross, but he lives. He should have died for our sins. Seraphine and Andy have a baby, and the scene is all bright and fuzzy like in a soap opera. Ah, But wait, the baby has... Uh, werewolf eyes, I guess. In the middle of the day. I know John Land has directed Thriller, but it's really weird to pay tribute to that when you barely paid tribute to an American werewolf in London. So, movie over, right? No. There's an alternate ending that's even stupider. Andy and Seraphine get married inside the Statue of Liberty's torch on the down low, but there's no officiant, and they apparently snuck in, so I don't know what the fuck is up with that. Chris fumbles the ring, and it falls off the statue. So Seraphine and Andy bungee jump after it to make their fake illegal wedding official. Andy grabs the ring impossibly, puts it on Seraphine's finger in mid-air, and they kiss as they're probably launched into the Hudson River. The fucking end. Should you watch An American Werewolf in Paris? No, not really. Not even if you like the original film, because there's barely anything that made that film great in the sequel. The CG is soulless, the main character is a wiener, and the tone of the story is more superhero than horror. The classic Wolfman movies are more likely to scare you than this flick. I give an American werewolf in Paris a condom bubble out of graveyard sex. Beware the moon. Oh. You know, you can't just pop up and tell me what to do. I don't even know why I'm listening to you. I know you're dead, and so do the police.